So welcome everybody to the today's seminar of the Research Center of the Academy of Athens. Uh, the first for the new academic year, if I would say so. Uh, now today we have the pleasure to have with us a guest from the University of Cape Town of South Africa, uh, Dr. Marco Hillebrand. Uh, he is uh, working on dynamical systems. He got recently his PhD under the supervision of Paris Coco, so he can be considered as a, a, a collaborator of our research institute. And uh, we have an online, uh, an ongoing, excuse me, collaboration. Uh, you got uh, the announcement. Uh, the talk will be about chaos in DNA. We have heard in the past some other talks on, on this subject, and uh, we we may, Malcolm, we may start. So we should share screen. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Professor Patsis. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for having me. And we were giving you this opportunity to, to present here in Athens. Um, and yeah, it is a, a privilege to be here. Um, so thank you very much. So uh, as you can see, okay, uh, hopefully, I don't know if we can get rid of this. Uh, yeah. All right, sort of quick technical thing. What is the excuses from the top? Or just probably probably. Okay. This should do that. This should go down, but I don't know. Okay. okay. Oh, well, um, it'll be okay. Uh, okay. So, so, yes, we are talking about chaos and we are talking about DNA and we are talking about bubbles. These are the three main uh, ideas which I would like to, let's say, discuss or communicate today. And we'll see how they all link together. And yes, so this work is in collaboration with a few very good scientists, one which is well known to many of you, Harris Kokos, uh, my PhD supervisor, who I'm now working with as a postdoc, and then George Kalosikas from the University of Patras and Adam Bishop in Los Alamos. Great. So basically, the talk is going to go through a few points. We're going to talk about the background, what is DNA, how does it work, why does it work, why do we care about what we're doing. Then we're going to establish some statistics, a general background of what's going on with bubbles and DNA, and of course I'll introduce what on earth a bubble is, and move on from the general case to a specific case of studying bubbles in relevant DNA sequences that we find in, in real life, and then move on to the chaos, and we'll see what happens with chaos in these molecules. Great. So for those of you without a biology background, like me, uh, my biology education stopped in grade nine. But what is DNA? DNA is this fairly well-known double helix structure where we have this backbone, and these, this backbone is connected by base pairs. And so these base pairs are pairs of bases and the bases that we are allowed are adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And so in our sort of simplistic applied mathematics world, this is what we need to care about, that we have 80 and GC base pairs. These are the only possible pairings allowed. And this, of course, becomes important. Hmm, let me see. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Oh. Okay, where's, where's good to put? There we go. <laughs> that should be fine. <laughs> Bad um, Great. Uh, so the sequence of base pairs 
AT and GC, right? This becomes our alphabet uh, for genetic code. So these all the genetic information in, for example, the human chromosome is encoded in the sequence of these base pairs. And each base pair sequence corresponds to an amino acid. So yes. Is it important if it's A, T, or T, A? Yes, for the genetics. Less so for the dynamics. I will discuss that in a second. That's an excellent it's question. It's not just the sequence of pairs. It's also the, the sequence of bases. Yeah, but one pair could be A, T, or T, A. Yes. Yes. That's a different sequence then? Yes. Um, so yes, good point. So the sequence of, let's say, bases rather than base pairs uh, is important. And yes, yeah, so this encodes for amino acids. And this is kind of the, the synthesis process. So if we go from the, the genetic code to amino acids to proteins, and then these proteins are what actually form cells and matter. So this is kind of our end goal. And so the sequence of bases is simple but important, both dynamically, as we will see, and of course, genetically. Oh, oh, oops. So, there we go. So the question is then, how does this happen? How do we go from this alphabet, right? So we encode information, um, but how do we go from information to actual physical cells? And this process is transcription, uh, where we communicate the DNA base sequence into amino acids and we allow synthesis. So how this happens is that we take our DNA double helix, we open it up, and this opening up is done by an enzyme, the messenger, um, the RNA polymerase. So there's a, a specific enzyme which comes and rips open the DNA sequence, uh, DNA helix, which allows this messenger RNA to communicate with the sequence. So it literally comes in and copies the sequence of bases along one of the strands of DNA. And that then gets taken down the, down the chain for actual synthesis. And one of the questions that we're trying to ask, or we are asking and trying to answer, is how the enzyme knows where to bind. So there are well-established genetic markers that people have seen uh, in the base pair sequence that sort of seem to mark this is where binding occurs, this is where binding happens. But there's still not a clear understanding of why the enzyme chooses to bind at a particular place and how, yeah, how the openings of the, the double helix correspond to the beginning of transcription. It's not entirely clear why transcription starts at the transcription start site. Why does it start where it starts? So we would like to know. They do not uh, join the uh, basis that is opposite to it necessarily, else it will be copied exactly the same thing. Uh, so for the, the this RNA. Yeah, well, it is open as mm -hmm. in, the, in the figure there, but then uh, let's take the left one. G will not uh, then join C, which is just exactly below. Or no, 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 it will stick. So who decides about that? So it is like moving one of the two parts of the helix, let's say. Yeah, so the, the helix opens up to yes. two single strands. Okay. And so then the messenger RNA picks one strand. Okay. Uh, and then puts it where? Uh, so, so it comes, so it comes, it copies. Yes. It copies all of this, and then it leaves. So once it's it, uh, it's replicated, it will this bubble moves along, and moves. yes. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Of course. So the the polymerase moves along and yeah. opens and copies. Okay. Uh, okay. Is that more or less clear? Thanks. So. Good. Yeah. Please uh, stop and ask questions. That's that's excellent. Good. So this is our process of transcription, taking information down the line to do synthesis. Grand. So now stepping back from the biology and going into applied maths, we want to reduce this to something as simple as possible that we can actually start modeling and start studying. Because we can study DNA using you know, normal uh, molecular dynamic simulations, but it becomes extremely expensive extremely quickly to actually get detailed molecular simulations. So our essentials are the CX structure, base pairs, which come in two types, and crucially, AT base pairs have two hydrogen bonds, and GC base pairs have three. So 
dynamically, this is our, you know, our key difference, right? There's a much stronger force between the G and the C bases. So this is going to feature strongly in our however, however we choose to model uh, the molecule. Perfect. So what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce the periodic pressure of Doxor model, which is the model that we've used. And essentially what this does is it crunches everything down, it takes this double helix, and we treat it as a one-dimensional lattice. So we quote unquote ignore the twisting by encoding it into our coupling parameters. So all these uh, stacking interactions, we will encode into our model and I'll explain in a second, but essentially we simplify it to a one-dimensional lattice. And now this is much nicer, great. And if we want to simplify it further and we can or we cannot, we don't have to, but we can ignore dynamically speaking, whether it's A and T or T and A, right? Because if our first assumption is just that Right, this is two base pairs, uh, two hydrogen bonds, and this is three hydrogen bonds, then right, that's all that, that's all that matters, right? We'll ignore the rest and just go with this very simplest, uh, disordered one dimensional non linear lattice. So, under this sort of construction process, we can produce our potential. Okay, so this is the potential that they came up with in the 90s, which has two components. The first is the Morse potential. And so this is a very typical chemical potential where we have very strong repulsion as the bases get way too close together, there's a strong force pushing them apart. And as they drift apart, there's an attractive force to bring them together. But if they drift too far apart, right? If you imagine the two strands of the helix completely separated by kilometers, there's no longer any force, there's no attraction. And so that corresponds to a plateau in the potential. So very nice um, on-site uh, potential, non-linear, of course, which is also nice. And then we have a coupling term. And so here we have, we saw actually the model started with just considering harmonic coupling, uh, as all good models do. And then they added this non-linearity non to be much more realistic. Um, so in order to reproduce experimental results of um, openings, they require this nonlinearity, and so they added that in. And the last note is this Kn. So if we wish to take into account the specific base sequence rather than just the base pairs, um, we have a slightly different uh, coefficient to account for the different stacking interactions between A, T, G, and C. So each of those four possible bases can, of course, have each neighbor can be one of those four bases. And depending on that, uh, that neighborhood coupling, we can have a slightly different uh, constant. Okay, so that takes care of that. And it turns out that this makes a small but important difference in some cases. Great. Yes. The summation is over all the bases of the. Yes. So you have to place the two molecules one next to the other and compare all of them and check the potential. But in reality, I would assume that one part of the one molecule gets close to another part of the other molecule. So only some, a small number, not total length, but another, another number may come close. Uh, yes. So I'm saying you have to place the two molecules one next to the other. And okay, so just to be clear, this um, Yn corresponds to the separation of base pairs, right? So this model is for the double helix. The whole double helix. Um, so our system is this uh, double helix, which is somehow only self-interacting. So of course, in a real solution, you'd have all kinds of solvent effects in other molecules. But if I understand your question correctly, um, this potential is just for the bases corresponding to one molecule. Is that what you're asking? I was thinking more of how you replicate the molecule. Uh -huh. Two strands approach and then they connect or they do not connect. Okay, so for this, we're not considering the transcription. You're not. Okay. Yeah, okay, okay. So this is just for thermal fluctuations of the, okay, the molecule. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Good question. Perfect. So then we can move on to what we want to study, which is uh, these bubbles. And simply a bubble is an opening, right? So we have 
our sort of simplified representation of a molecule and these things fluctuate and with some forces and this is what you get a bubble they are typically thermally induced but they can be artificially induced as you've seen with the enzyme right we can have a bubble induced by an external force we're not going to discuss that so much right now but focus more on these thermally induced uh, natural bubbles and of course as we increase the temperature this becomes more prevalent high temperature larger fluctuations fully expected and this we posit and other people have looked at may be related to transcription right as soon as we see a bubble we're starting to think hmm this is a little bit transcription -y. so when a, when, a, when a bubble occurs, what happens to the Hamiltonian? So it's a, a term that goes to zero or so? Uh, well, when the bubble occurs, uh, this stuff kind of linearizes and we'll end up with, uh, you know, there's no on-site force and just some small force on the side. So some forces. Yeah, so we'll, I'll look a little bit later when I talk about chaos. We'll discuss what happens uh, with this large, uh, large YN limit. Um, yeah, that's a, a very interesting point. And so, yeah, so to define a bubble, we will simply say that a bubble of length L is L consecutive open base pairs. Okay, very straightforward. And if we have a fully separated uh, molecule, you can call it a, a bubble of length N or just call it melted or, or denatured. The question, however, in our dynamical model now becomes what do we consider open experimentally if we want to measure whether base pairs are open we can we can calculate the fraction of open base pairs based on ultraviolet absorption so depending on whether the bases are open or closed the absorption spectrum is different and so the experimental definition is based on that but in our dynamical model we have these yn separations and the question remains do we consider this open is this sufficiently open um, and how do we decide? Um, and so this is basically the starting point of our journey to understanding these bubbles is, okay, this definition is great, but what does open mean? And so to find what open means now to number of face in our model, we use the definition of melting. And since the biological definition of melting is that a DNA molecule is considered melted or denatured when exactly half of the base pairs are open. Okay, and so there are experimental denaturation curves, which you can look at. And what we can do is because we know the melting temperature for our model, and of course, generally for, for DNA molecules, we can take a whole bunch of different uh, molecule cons constituents. We can take percentage, you know, half GC, half AT, quarter GC, quarter, uh, three quarters AT, so on. We can vary this percentage find the melting point for each one, each percentage, and then find a threshold that satisfies this melting uh, criterion, right? So we go to the melting point, we know the temperature, and then we just find a threshold that matches that. So that when we get to melting, according to our threshold, half the base pairs are open. And actually it turns out rather beautifully because just taking a single threshold for AT and a single threshold for GC based pairs, we can more or less exactly hit this requirement of 50% open. Uh, interesting. Which application can they see? Anyway, um, we can see, we can, yeah, we match exactly. So the, the pure AT and the pure GC case, that makes sense, we'd expect that. The really nice thing is that even the intermediate cases, clearly these thresholds actually work more generally, which is nice. Furthermore, these thresholds actually relate back to the parameters of the Morse potential. Um, so the parameters, of course, are fitted based on experimental results. So they take the model, they fit to experimental melting curves. And so it's quite neat that by fitting the model to those uh, experiments, we actually end up fitting a threshold value at the same time. Great. So this now answers our question. What does open mean? Aha. If Y is greater than this, it's open. Great. Life is easy. Hmm. So for some numerical details of what we actually do, obviously the one thing that this coarse grain model, right, this Hamiltonian uh, simplified model allows us to do is a lot of simulations. We can go wild and 
generate large numbers of statistics. We sacrifice some accuracy, right? We're not accounting for every single uh, atomic interaction, but we are able to do mass simulations. So what we do is we treat this as a lattice. Um, so it's constant energy, Hamiltonian, good stuff, symplectic integration. So we can go to obnoxiously long times without losing accuracy. Um, and this is something which is a sort of surprisingly big advantage actually um, in this biophysics world where a lot of things are done in for example uh, constant temperature and then you don't have this advantage of subjective integration or of course if it's just non-hamiltonian um, so this is very nice and we'll discuss a bit later about why it's important and yeah then we will go through both arbitrary sequences to develop a, a baseline of generally what's going on and then we look at specific biological sequences. Um, and essentially what we do for this section is we just record the opening separation. So for every base pair at every time step, we just record the displacement and then we analyze from there. Uh, this one is. It is adonis. Yes. So, yes. It is, this approximation is fairly uh, Yes, uh, it, it matches. Uh, a number of experimental results we can. It obviously comes with caveats. So we, we, we always have to say there are limitations. We are studying the internal dynamics and somehow ignoring the effects of the environment. Well, so, I mean, ignoring it's in the model to a weak extent, but definitely I wouldn't produce a result of this and say, ah, this is what you will see in the laboratory. Uh, you have to be careful with how you interpret them, for sure. Yeah. In your previous slide here, the human body has a certain temperature, which mm -hmm. is 36 degrees, which is roughly uh, 310. 309, 310, yeah. roughly there. Yeah. And if we move away from that temperature, we die. Yeah. Is that the reason we die, that the DNA just gets apart? Or? I think other things break down first. Um, I think the brain is more sensitive than DNA, but it's an interesting question because uh, you, know, you could certainly have, if you have a fever, uh, for example, and maybe you're particularly heat resistant or something, you, you know, it's surprisingly easy to get to this 315 Kelvin um, pure AT melting point. So you, you yeah, I, I'm not gonna comment too much on that, whether it's possible to denature your DNA in your body and still stay alive, probably in some edge cases, but typically, uh, yeah, I suspect by you reach, time you reach this point. So one thing is to die and not stay alive. The other thing is that the DNA in our body has a sizable fraction of it that is detached, according to this At all uh, yeah, times, yeah. at all times, parts of it are, are yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah, yeah. 30% roughly or 40% of it. Well, uh, we'll see in a second, actually, um, some sort of, displacement uh, probabilities of opening. But yeah, exactly what this fraction says that, yeah, we have these fluctuations going on all the time. Um, and one of the uh, things we're suggesting or trying to understand is that maybe this is part of how transcription begins, that we have these natural fluctuations, right? And so if you have some tightly clamped region with very few fluctuations, the enzyme doesn't want to go there. But if you have a region with large natural fluctuations, maybe the enzyme does want to go there. Uh, so that's what we'll discuss just now. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, as we speak, our DNA is breathing um, in this manner. Great. So let's get cracking. We can basically start with doing two things. So the first thing we want to understand is how probable is it to find a bubble of a given length? Okay, so we know they happen uh, with some more or less stochastic probability. But what's the probability of a good length L bubble occur? And once you find a bubble, what's the probability of it having a particular lifetime? And so this now is purely dynamical. This we can study using you know, Monte Carlo simulations or whatever else we want. But this is sort of our selling point of where we say, okay, this is purely a dynamical phenomenon. Um, can we provide some insight by using this? And Given that we're interested in large bubbles, the, the, for context, the transcription bubble is around 13 base pairs long, typically. Um, and we're interested in large, long-lived bubbles. These are the, the outlier events which we would like to investigate a little bit. 
So, okay, let's get into some, some nice numbers. We have the probability distributions. So we just step back for a second. Simply what we're doing is trying to understand, given a length L, what is the probability of seeing a bubble with that length? Okay, so if you ask me, how likely am I to see a bubble of length five base pairs in my 60% AT DNA sequence? Now I'll come here and I'll say, okay, let's find this point and find this point correspond to uh, somewhere between 50 and 25. And this gives you the probability of finding a bubble of that length. And so these plots- For a certain temperature. Yes, for a certain temperature. So these are now all at physiological temperature. So all the results for the bubbles, X and point, are at 310 Kelvin, give or take, right? So we have fluctuations around 310 Kelvin. We have constant energy, not constant temperature, but on average, 310 Kelvin. Which in your simulation means the fixed value of energy? Yes, so fixed value of energy, and so now temperature oscillates around, uh, around this value. Um, and so yes, these just represent the two models. So this model does not take into account the sequence dependence. So this is a slightly more simplified version. And this is a slightly more complex version. We get slightly different results, but you know you can see the tails of the distributions are different, but it, it's not uh, it's not that huge. And so essentially, yeah, you can see the the details of how we do this. Basically, vast vast numbers of statistics to actually get these you know very very small probabilities. We, to track them reasonably, we need large statistics. And we get a stretched exponential shape. So even these very short bubbles, right? If you can consider a single base pair as a bubble, okay, it's not really a bubble, but in some, you know, whatever mathematical sense, we're called a bubble of length one. And we have a rapid decrease in probability. And so actually, by the time we start getting to these uh, tens of base pairs bubble, we are we are in the small probability region. Right, so we're not going to see a lot of those given, yeah. You know, so given a thousand uh, base pairs, we might find one bubble of length ten. Okay, so this is our first result. Probabilities of bubbles, they get pretty small. Large bubbles are rare. And once you find this large bubble, does it live for very long? What we can do is the same thing. We can construct a probability distribution for bubble of length L and lifetime T. So now let's say we pick these are some representative cases. So let's take L equals three. So length three bubbles, and we take all the length three bubbles we find in our simulations. So we extract the data. We extract the lifetimes of every single bubble of exactly length three. Um, the mechanism of that is a little bit. Yeah, that's up for discussion about how exactly, for example, if a bubble is of length three and then fluctuates to become a bubble of length four, and then it closes again to length three, we consider those all separate bubbles because at some point you have to uh, make a definition. And so all these bubbles are length three, we find their lifetimes and we get some slightly squonky stretched exponentials again. Okay, so once again, if I want to find out uh, how likely am I to get a bubble of length three that lives for 0 0.4 picoseconds? I can pick my GC percentage and find that. Great. And we can see that the shape changes almost qualitatively from this very much stretched uh, and bumpy behavior for the shorter bubbles. The longer bubbles are pretty much just exponential. The stretching kind of falls away. Okay. So, this is telling us large bubbles with long lifetimes are in some sense double exponentially rare, right? Very low chance of long lifetimes, very low chance of existing in the first place. Yeah, well, yeah. What's also interesting is to consider the slightly pathological short bubble case, because purely from a lattice dynamics point of view, this is kind of interesting to see, okay, what the heck, why do we have these double peaks? Um, we don't actually have a, a concrete answer to that. Uh, there might be some piles Navarro um, pinning or some kind of 
especially in the disordered cases, we can understand what's going on. But why in the pure GC sequence do we have these defined peaks? We have these somehow natural oscillations which occur, which is quite nice, but ultimately biologically not relevant because these are purely dynamical oddities. They don't really relate to where the model is supposed to function. So mathematically, dynamically interesting, but for biological reasons, we kind of put this to one side and say, okay, that's kind of neat, but yeah, not really going to spend too much more time on that. Great. So what we want to do is actually sort of ground this baseline and say, all right, in general, we can compute an average bubble lifetime, right? So these distributions are all very well, but what we actually want to know is typically how long does a bubble live, right? If I give you an arbitrary uh, bubble of eight base pairs long, how long should it expect it to live? And so that's what this plot tells us. So as we go from pure AT all the way down to pure GC, we find that actually in AT sequences, we have much longer lived bubbles um, than the GC sequences, despite the more generous threshold or perhaps because of it. But clear trend, shorter bubbles live longer, although it does flatten out. And once we get to this uh, 10 base pair region, we seem to have this more as a plateau. And as we increase the GC percentage, the bubble lifetimes shorten. Uh, so there is definitely uh, some disorder effect uh, going on here. Great. So this is now our general case background bubble lifetime. This quantity is basically what we want to take forward as a single number which describes uh, a particular sequence. How can we use this? Unless you just like statistics, we want to apply it to a, a viral promoter and to a bacterial promoter and see, okay, so if we look at these, these bubbles in particular cases, do we get typical behaviors? Do we get atypical behaviors? And what happens if we mutate these promoters? So to start with, let's look at a viral promoter. So the P5 uh, sequence is a promoter, uh, which is a key part of the transcription process for uh, replicating viruses. And bubbles here, around what we call the transcription start site. Yeah, uh, the clue is the name, it's where the transcription begins. Um, and bubbles around here in the sequence are particularly important. So here, what I've done is I've taken, instead of averaging over the whole sequence, I consider the sequence itself. So this tells you the sequence of base pairs, black is GC, uh, white is AT. Uh, so give us a kind of map of the sequence. And I consider, for every site in our lattice, for every base pair, I plot the average lifetimes of bubbles starting at that site. So if I want to find the average lifetime of bubbles of length five starting at site one, I go to this pixel over here and I find that it's something just below 0 0.2 picoseconds. Okay. So this map tells us average lifetimes of bubbles of length L starting at site I. <coughs> Okay, so if I look at this, clearly we have long lived bubbles in these regions corresponding to 80 bands. Okay, and this is now very intuitive, right? We saw from the previous slide in 80 sequences, we have more you know, longer lived bubbles in general. And we see that reproduced here in some sort of local sense. Great. And we do have bubbles around the transcription start site, just sort of some, you know. You can see something here if you wanted to. Um, but perhaps what's more important or more interesting <laughs> is to mutate it. So let's take a mutation, a known experimental mutation of this P5 promoter, which inhibits transcription. So we flip two base pairs. We'll go here from AT to GC. And this is known to dramatically reduce the amount of transcription that happens. And if we do our lifetime plot again, we see, OK, there is definitely some kind of difference here. Um, the lifetimes of these bubbles are distinctly shorter. Again, makes sense. We've added GC, which we know is a, a, a bubble shortener. But let's uh, make our lives a bit easier and consider the relative difference, right? Instead of just looking at two plots and saying, oh, yes, this one is different to this one, 
uh, we can actually compute the relative difference and, and be more concrete. So by computing this relative difference, we come here again and see, aha, this is now very clear. We have a you know, around just above 20 or below 20% decrease in the average lifetime due to this mutation. Okay, so what this tells us is that we have some loose kind of dynamic signature of this mutation, right? So in considering the bubble lifetimes, there seems to be some signature of, of this, this mutation. Okay, so that's nice. And it's something to take forward. And we can consider the opposite case where instead of inhibiting transcription, we enhance it, okay? So we take the LAC operon, uh, the promoter region of the LAC operon, which is in E. coli bacteria, and we do the same thing, right? So we take our sequence, compute our average bubble lifetimes. And here, the important sites are the sigma binding sites, uh, which are 30 and 10, uh, minus 30, minus 10. So these are the regions that we're particularly interested in for, for this sequence. And this is a bit longer, so it's a bit more, lots of peaks. We can, again, we can, we can see what we expect. That when we have these 80 bands, longer lifetimes, longer lifetimes. But what happens when we apply our UE5 mutation? So here, instead of flipping GC to 80, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to take a couple of these guys and where are they? Here, yeah, remove them, turn them to 80, and see what happens. Okay, from this plot, playing spot the difference is not very rewarding. It's kind of hard to see anything. So we'll go straight to the relative difference plot and see, uh huh. Okay, as expected, we have longer lived bubbles. Okay, actually, even more uh, effective than the decrease from the previous mutation. So, this is quite nice. We've now got a transcription enhancing mutation, which corresponds to an increase in bubble lifetime. So, there seems to be some kind of link here. It's, yeah, it's not something that jumps out at you and say, oh, obviously, this is a completely clear you know, test that we can just take any sequence and we can immediately tell you how transcriptionally active it is from the dynamics. But there's a definite picture that we can see here of how the dynamics are affected by transcription uh, inhibition. So that's quite neat. Yeah. How does the length define length of position whatever, mm -hmm. minus 39? What is the definition of that position there is a length? So this is a, the average, in, lifetime in general, of a, in the yeah. plot, mm -hmm. in the general, how, how do you find length at a certain position? So bubbles of this length, right? So we bubbles of this length at that position. Yes. So if I have, so I can check here. I can take. So I take all the bubbles that start. That start. Yes, at that. That's side. why the the, 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 the red. The yes. Huge yes. On one side, it's not that that position is part of a bubble. Yes. You're yes. talking about bubbles that start in that position. Yes. That's why the, all the curves are. Yeah, yeah. So, so all the bubbles that start here are affected, and all the bubbles that end here are affected, right? Um, so, exactly. Um, that's what. Okay, good. Is, yeah. Are mm. these distributions like a Poisson distribution? If, if you just assume very roughly that you have a probability of opening and one minus that probability of closing at the point, and then you're asking, what's the probability of having 10 open points? Isn't that like a Poisson? Uh, very roughly, you know, without yeah. no interaction, nothing. Just probability of opening and closing, like flipping a point. Yeah, yeah. so the original um, models of DNA here were Ising-like Ising -like models. Ising -like. Um, yes. Yeah, and so they, they do these things. And so you can get pretty good. Uh, results for these kinds of distributions <clears throat> um, for the opening probabilities. Uh, definitely, you, you can get very reasonable results from these Eisenman like things. But the dynamics, these lifetimes, it's a little bit less clear how you would get that from uh, this. These are more complex. Yeah. For example, the second peak that you mentioned before in the probability mm -hmm. of a double peak, maybe that's the second peak of Poisson distribution somehow. Yeah, yeah it's, a good, it's a good thought. I haven't thought about uh, how we can yeah, do something like, like this for, for the lifetime. I haven't thought about uh, these, yeah, the sort of distributional approach. Yeah, it's a good thought. Okay, I think, okay, one more thing before we get to chaos 
it's just a brief mention that so that, this far we've just been working with what nature gives us we, we randomly simulate and get thermal bubbles um but we can also force the issue and say okay what happens if we give it a large bubble how does the, the molecule react so we'll do something like this we'll take a thermalized lattice we'll artificially plug in this massive peak and uh, so we'll just scale everything and it's rescale all the other displacements to make sure that our energy remains constant and everything is well behaved and you see how does this large perturbation evolve in time um, so this is an average plot sort of representative of what happens yeah, so this is the displacement this is a displacement with respect to time along the tiny sequence uh, i'll explain the next slide in a little bit more detail so the bubble is not probably no, it's saying it's staying it's localized. Zero. Yeah. And there is no dynamics like vibration. Yeah. So these uh, these uh, oscillations uh, are, are are definitely evidence. So we'll discuss. So it's kind of like a, it's a breather. Um, and actually, what we see happens is okay, I'll skip to the next slide now because it's more relevant. Is we get this kind of behavior. So if we take the autocorrelation function for uh, displacement and energy, um, then we can actually track what's going on with the dynamics of this up and down motion. So the bubble starts large. So for the first, actually for a surprisingly long time, right? So this is a couple of picoseconds. The bubble itself just stays, it stays where it is. This is this very large perturbation. And then it drops and oscillates. And so the, the bubble itself has this oscillatory behavior and then it settles down to what we see here right we see this kind of coherent state uh, and this is kind of this is something which we are uh, in the process of investigating more actually because this is quite neat that like we have this slow dispersion process right so massive perturbation it oscillates towards the natural coherent state corresponding to this width um, so obviously, if you change the width of the bubble, you will get slightly different coherent states and different height, and then it slowly disperses back to equilibrium, right? And so we see that in the correlation function as well as in the actual displacement, and the energy basically shows the same thing, but it's somehow quieter, right? So we we have some oscillations, but it remains localized, and then in log time it uh, it disperses, and so this is quite neat. Um, and we can calculate relaxation times uh, from these again stretched exponentials. And actually, this is our one of our most encouraging results because, in terms of justifying the model, these relaxation times we find here are more or less the same as have been found using detailed molecular dynamic simulations. So, our sort of Hamiltonian mass statistics approach actually seems to be valid for for understanding these time scales. So yeah, this is a paper that we recently submitted. And yeah, these things are quite interesting to me to understand both the process of this uh, coherence forming and understanding of these coherent states in the context of transcription bubbles. So maybe there's something here which relates to particular um, promoter sequences. You can understand something there. And that's the, the long-term aim of this project is to understand what's going on with that. Okay, so. In the last few minutes, let's talk about chaos. Um, so, so strung you out with a lot of biology for, for half an hour or a bit longer, but now we can actually talk about chaos. And right, we have a Hamiltonian. We can plow ahead and just understand it as a lettuce and compute our, our normal quantities for chaos. And once again, we're gonna do it in two steps. We're gonna look at the global case, what's going on generally, and what's going on specifically in near bubbles. And so for the global case, we will do our favorite thing, which is compute the upper exponents. Um, and we will take a whole bunch of cases and we will calculate these finite time Lyapunov exponents, saturate them out and get an average Lyapunov exponent for, hmm. yeah, you can't really win here. Um, Anyway, this just, this just gives you the uh, the parameters. So it's particular energy value, particular AT percentage, right? Because there are basically two things we can vary here. 
the energy and the composition of the sequence. So those are the two things we're going to, to vary and understand what happens with the chaoticity. And by chaoticity, in this case, I just mean the Lyapunov really exponent. So let's do that. So as we change energy and as we consider various ATGC compositions, we get these curves for the average Lyapunov experiment. So again, tens or hundreds of thousands of simulations, average things out. And what do we get? Okay, we get three regions. This here and this last one. Note that we stop at the melting point. So as soon as the DNA reaches the melting temperature, the model kind of loses relevance. And so we, we cut there. But here, the color is not so clear. But at first, the pure AT sequences are the most chaotic. Right, so the largest Lyapunov number exponent corresponds to pure AT. And then here we have some mixing of the heterogeneous sequences with higher GC content. And then here, as we start heading up towards physiological temperature, it seems to make no difference whatsoever, right? So whatever 80 percentage you have, you're going to have the same Lyapunov exponent. Uh, around here, by the way, is the physiological temperature. And so we see some dispersion there. Because here we have a turning point in that the higher GC content sequences actually become more chaotic. Uh, this is, I'm 95% sure, but still uh, kind of thinking about, is due to the occurrence of bubbles. Because as soon as you start opening up more and more, this fundamentally alters the dynamics. And we'll discuss why now. Because we have two regions of near linearity. If we come here, very small the upper point at very small energy, very typical, expected. No, there's not much dynamics going on, there's not much chaos. As we shoot past melting, uh, we actually see complete linearization, right? So as we crank up the energy to a sufficient degree that we get this absolute separation, uh, our Lyapunov exponent calculation goes to zero with our linear slope in, in long time, telling us perfectly linear dynamics. Okay, this is nice, but why? And this now comes back to um, the earlier point that, of course, if these yi expand, everything drops out and we end up with simply uh, this exponential going to one, so this uh, zero, so we get just a uh, constant term. And this drops away and this leaves us with a harmonic coupling. So in the case where all statements are very large, of course, we just end up with harmonic oscillators and we get linearity. And that's quite nice. And the question that I'm now trying to ask, and I don't yet have a complete answer for, but I will show you in a moment, is if we have melting, we have a completely open, fully linear system. If we have a bubble, we have a partially open system. Is it locally linear? And so here we turn to um, the deviation vector distribution to try and understand local chaos. So we have global chaos and the have no exponent. Now, if we consider where these stretching components are largest, that'll tell us something about the local chaoticity. So explicitly it's calculated like this. So we normalize the DVD. And then so for a given site in our lattice I, we combine the momentum and position deviations and normalize it. And we, that gives us how much the deviation is stretching at that site. So now let's look at the bubble. So let's take one of these guys that we, we just spoke about where we plug in a large, a large Gaussian and we have these oscillations. What happens in the DVD? So here we see a few details. Okay, first we have these red lines on the outskirts of the bubble. This is what we expect because inside the bubble we're expecting linearity, but on the very edge of the bubble we have this somehow maximum non-linearity because we have very large displacement on one side and relatively small on the other side. So we're still in the it's called the nonlinear regime, but there should be some sort of intense stretching. And so that's what we see with this, this red. I think what's going on here, where we initially have some deviation vector inside the bubble, is the momentum is still catching up. So as we insert this bubble, there is some sort of 
uh, response time before everything completely catches up. And then we have this completely dead zone as we have this oscillation here. And even as we recover, and so the, the bubble oscillates back up, still not very much to the DVD though. But the DVD firmly remains on the edge here. And then eventually, not eventually, quite quickly actually, as soon as this becomes not completely open, right? So we've gone from this ridiculously large. Um, so here we're in the large YN regime. And here we're merely in the fairly large YN regime. And so where we have fairly large, not extremely large uh, fluctuations, this we expect to be very chaotic, right? So we're sort of fully exploiting the non-linearity of our potentials by these large and large varying uh, spaces. So we get this concentration of chaos near this region again. So this is a picture I'm still trying to understand uh, to see, okay, is it dynamically interesting, useful? Can we actually understand anything about these bubbles from the chaos? Uh, because there are patterns here and there might be some links, uh, but that's something which, yeah, is, is still to be fully understood. So let me close by then saying we can use these mesoscale models, uh, these of course grain Hamiltonians, to actually understand some of what's going on with the biophysical properties of bubbles uh, in these sequences. We studied mutations of particular real promoters uh, to understand if there's a link between bubble lifetimes and transcription behavior. And it does seem to be a kind of dynamical signature, uh, as was suggested a few years ago by the group in Los Alamos. And definitely the effects of large openings are felt long after initial separation. So if we plug in this, uh, this big old breather and we give it time to evolve, it, it is felt for, for a very long time in the sequence. And finally, there is definitely chaos here. Um, of course, it's a you know, many degree of freedom, non-linear system. We expect chaos, we find chaos. Chaos depends on the energy and on the exact composition of the molecule. And there seems to be some kind of definite link with bubbles and chaos where on the edge of the bubbles, there is chaos inside the bubble, less so until it completely relaxes. And then, yeah, there are some references where this work has been published. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I think we're a little bit outside of our everyday field. Let's try here to Stop, uh, stop sharing, right? So that we see again. So uh, questions, if there are any here. Uh, well, Jens asked. Uh, the way that the helix is formed, uh, you cannot really take one, two, two strands and move them very far away. If they cannot move away, they are Intertwined. So, well, even if you want to break a link, it will never move very far away. It will stay somewhere there because. Well, in the so biologically, when you when your double helix starts melting, uh, these so the individual bases can open up, right? They're not they're not glue. They yeah, they go. That's what's happening here all the time, right? Is there's they're they're bonded together, but there is this fluctuation, and they will. They'll open up, and then if their neighbors are still bound together, they'll come back together. But you can get this um, these very large openings, which then you can start uh, twisting the helix. Right, so the helix is initially twisted together, and it's very compact because of the the pi electron loads or whatever. As it straightens out, those interactions start falling away a bit, and so you can get this complete separation. Um, from even just from from thermalization. So when you open up, you break the helical structures. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you go from this double helix into just two individual strands. Yeah. Are there other questions from the audience than from people that are online? If yes, you should. Oh, okay. We yeah. Can yeah. One question. Uh, regarding the model, so mm -hmm. the model the DNA has. Uh, as a nominal lattice, mm -hmm. I would expect to be more like two couple of lattices, so that you have uh, each of, because uh, it, mm -hmm. it's uh, so. But on the other hand, when you say C of n, which is the displacement, 
you consider that it's you always have like this symmetric displacement, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's the, due to the symmetry you you use the one lattice. Yes. So actually, it started with with two, right? So you have the position of base and the position of the bases. So you have two two n variables. Yes. Um, then you just consider in phase and out of phase motion, uh, and that reduces. Uh, to this, so actually the the y and here are somewhat like square root of two of the okay. original deviation. Uh, yes, yeah. So that's how it started. Are there works trying to model like the three D dynamics of the of the of the DNA and yes the role of displacement in different directions? So not only symmetrical. Yeah. So there are a, so a number of variants of this model, of the PBD model, where people have tacked on terms to understand. A specific helicity and so on. Um, and there are also other models. So you get much more complicated atomistic models with a potential 10 pages long, which account for every detail. And then there's sort of a range in between. But I think the thing is, these kind of simplistic models give you know, results much above their weight. So it's harder to, you know, so to get a slightly more accurate result it requires a lot more work but yeah definitely that's something which i'm curious about as well um, in terms of adding other forces and external forces as well i understand the role of a weak and strong chaos for example can compute the second one. yeah have you tried to do this and uh, to see the difference? Uh, so it, that's actually more or less ongoing. So we have um, a master student who might be here, I'm not sure did, um, a master student who's working on covariant definite vectors. And so one of the things we might well look at is multiple, um, especially in the case of the bubble, for example, if you have, yeah, yeah. let's say, 100 base pairs, and eight of them. It's easier the case. Maybe it's yeah, no, this is definitely an interesting point. And from curiosity, what is it technically integrated with you? Um, uh, so technically, we put a nice strong order for the SRK and B6. Ah, okay. okay. Uh, so this is also the library in Julia, I think, for the research. Yeah, probably. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, you showed this comparison between. Uh, DNAs that are easy to transcribe and others that are not. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that the difference was just a little bit different set of uh, bases. Right? Mm -hmm. But the, the difference that you found would look to be very small. I don't yeah. know how large it was, or small, or small. Do you think this is the reason what you're describing is the reason that one is more transcribable than the other, or there must be some other reason? Uh, I'm very agnostic about this one. Uh, uh, I, I would, if if this was the reason, I would have expected something stronger. Um, because I mean, I think what gets me is that intuitively, what makes sense is what I said at the beginning, right? If we have a natural inclination to open at a certain point, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, if we have a and naturally, you know, more likely to open region, that should be where the enzyme binds. I just sort of, as a physicist, you would intuitively say, okay, it's more likely to go to the soft spot. Um, but that I would expect to correspond to a sharper peak in the bubble lifetimes at that region, right? Because actually, we had longer lived bubbles in other regions, right? So the researchers looked at the large bubbles. The near the transcription start site for the P5 promoter, it was nothing special. Uh, in previous works, they seem to have found something there. I, I could not find anything. Um, so I'm still not quite sure how to interpret that. But I'm certainly not going to go to the biologist and say, I can solve all your problems. I really, uh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> that's uh, my, my concern as well. Thank you. Okay, so I don't see anybody else who is uh, about to ask something. So then we thank uh, Marco again. Yeah.